Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our online workshop panel, Work Better to Work Longer. Quality of working life is key to a more resilient labor market. My name is Andreas Edel. I'm the Executive Secretary of Population Europe, uh, the network of leading European research centers in the field of population studies. Our Secretariat is part of the Consortium of, of, of the Futurist Project, so I have the honor to represent today also my fellow colleagues and the members of our project consortium from Austria, Belgium, Finland, Germany, Italy and Poland. This is the first of a series of events within the Futurist Policy Lab and my colleague Arnstein Asfe from Bocconi University in Milan as the coordinator of this EU-funded project will say a few words about Futurist in a minute. Let me perhaps mention here only what the Futurist Policy Lab entails. We aim to offer room for transdisciplinary exchange among experts from research, politics, business, and civil society. The dialogue events, like the one we do today, which we'll hold over the next three years, will allow to, to learn from perspectives of others and to create a continuous flow of exchange and creation of new and policy relevant knowledge. This is also why I'm particularly delighted uh, to moderate a panel with such a distinguished group of decision makers and experts, and I will introduce each of them to you in a minute. Just a short remark on the course of the event. We will first have a round on the podium where the speakers will give a short statement. Then we will open the floor for interaction among the panelists, but also with you in the audience. And again, let me encourage you to post your question and comments at any point in time during the statements or during the event by using the Q&A button at the bottom of uh, your website page. During the next 60 minutes, we will discuss the future of working life. And this means not only how we work, but also how long we work. What are the social, economic, legal and technical conditions of an active, healthy and productive working life? Will longer working lives be a privilege of some, as access to labor markets depends, for instance, on educational attainment and the quality of working place? And will such inequalities affect social cohesion and intergenerational fairness as well? How realistic are these crisis scenarios? Which demographic factors might mitigate the effects of an aging workforce? And what policy recommendations can be drawn from recent experiences? Can we learn also from social policies in other countries, particularly in through of legal regulations of old age security? These are some of the questions we'll tackle today. And of course, we will not uh, find an answer for all of them in only 60 minutes, but at least we gain a better understanding of what could be on the social policy agenda in the coming years uh, in view of uh, strengthening, strengthening our population's resilience. Without further ado, let me now hand over to our eminent panels, uh, eminent part panelists, and uh, let me introduce our coordinator, Ernst and Asfi, to you. He's the coordinator of the EU funded Futurist Project and professor in demography at Bocconi University. After his academic career, which led him to Molde University College in Norway, the University of Bristol, the Max Planck Institute for Demographic Research, and the University of Leicester, he moved to Italy, where since 2007 demographer at Bocconi University, and since 2014 full professor in demography. He's hardly a Rion scholar and received already two of the prestigious grants of the European Research Council in 2007 and 2016. So, Arnie, the floor is yours. You have to unmute yourself, Annie. Thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, thanks for organizing, and thanks for uh, the invitation. I wanted to say a few more words about our Futures uh, project. Um, this is about uh, uh, aging, and it's about resilience. And uh, I probably don't have to say much about aging to this audience in the sense that we all see, we all observe, we all feel that aging is, is going on and is going to feel even more pertinent in the years to, to come. And the other side of um, the, the project is then about resilience and what does that mean uh, in an era of aging? And, and this is an important aspect because 
uh, when we think about resilience, we also think about shocks, crises, and, and big structural changes. So the aim of this project is to try to put on the uh, agenda, uh, how can we think about designing policies that help people become more resilient, i.e. overcome problems uh, as there are uh, shocks uh, happening. And that's the, sort of the broad uh, overarching aim of this, uh, this project. Now today, it's, it's, we are talking about one particular aspect, which is or, or one th part of this, this project, which is about uh, retirement decisions, uh, work longer, um, which is very much part of the aging process. And, uh, and the other aspect that is important of this project is this perspective of life course. Uh, so that is to say that aging is not only about old people. Uh, aging starts when, when you are young uh, and the kind of decisions you make uh, through your education, when you're young, well, what kind of job you take, that is going to have a consequence on, on what happens uh, to your well-being when you are older. So in that sense, a resilient policy is about trying to understand what can we do to help younger people uh, to cope and to uh, excel throughout their life course uh, with the aim that uh, the well-being when you get older is also better. So those are the that's the um, that's the overarching perspective, and perhaps that uh, I'll stop there by giving this overview, the, the more academic kind of overview, and then we hear from the others uh, uh, their perspective. Thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot, Ani, for this very uh, good in introduction to the uh, Futurist project. Um, now it's my, my very pleasure to introduce uh, Beatrice Kovasi to you. She's since 2022 member of the European Parliament, where she's affiliated with a group of the Progressive Alli Alliance of Socialists and Democrats in the European Parliament. Before, she made an impressive career in the diplomatic service of the European Union with stations in the United States, in Italy, the United Kingdom, and in various positions of the European Commission. She was also affiliated with the world of science and, for instance, taught at George Mason University and at the University of Hull in the UK. Uh, she won many prizes for engagement for women's rights, and she could easily win another one for the foundation of the network Lo Parlo Europeo, which promotes the European idea in her country. So thanks a lot, uh, Beatrice Kovasi, for joining us, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for this introduction. Thanks to Population Europe uh, uh, for this timely and important de debate, and thanks to Arnie Asve for uh, uh, the stimulating uh, research uh, that uh, um, he's conducting and, and for also involving me in this, uh, um, in this discussion. But I think I will take, of course, now a, a political angle to the discussion uh, and uh, starting from um, the evidence that uh, uh, Europe is aging, um, Italy is aging, uh, and this type of reality is something which is uh, uh, becoming alarming and cannot any longer be ignored by politicians. I mean, we have been uh, putting it under the carpet for, for quite a time, uh, but when we consider that today over one fifth of the EU population uh, is over 65, uh, and that the median age uh, is projected to increase uh, uh, by 2050 of over four years, bringing us to uh, the 48 years mark of median age, well, we do realize that we have to address the complexity of this challenge uh, from, um, from different angles and uh, putting together also different disciplines. Uh, today we're looking at the pension system and, and all these questions about the baby boomers, uh, you know, and, uh, and how we're coping and how the pension system is coping, I think are really questions uh, uh, which are on the first pages of all newspapers. Um, the uh, pressure under our pension system is unprecedented uh, and um, impacts at the same time younger generations' uh, um, capacity to enter the job market. So there is a big issue of uh, clearly intergenerational solidarity and social well-being. 
it is a quite disappointing, I would say, but until now governments um, have, uh, EU governments, I mean, including Italy, have uh, given responses uh, that are mainly on the economic side, uh, um, extending the retirement age and uh, um, crafting scenarios where we all have uh, uh, to work uh, uh, longer, uh, but clearly also having in mind, you know, the recent social unrest, I'm thinking of France in particular, huh? the, the, the social unrest the, that followed the uh, pension reform, it is clear that uh, um, this uh, decision, I mean, this policy option uh, cannot be considered uh, uh, the only one uh, and possibly it's not even the best one. So um, for sure, I would add, it's not a sustainable way forward. Uh, therefore, the question uh, is indeed, uh, I mean, the one that you put at the uh, outset, uh, how can we work better? We had uh, this period of COVID pandemic that was a sort of uh, uh, massive testing, I would say, of, uh, or, or a collective trial, if you want, of teleworking or finding different ways of uh, um, working together and also learning, uh, by the way, also uh, clearly education was impacted, uh, but enabled us to explore uh, to an unprecedented extent alternative solutions. And I think that, uh, again, thinking about my own country, so looking at Italy and, uh, and uh, the things I see uh, um, now happening, um, it is quite regrettable that after three years uh, in some sectors, notably the Italian public sector, you know, um, it seems that uh, we have stopped this experiment. It seems that we have gone back to office life uh, as it was before. Uh, in the private sector, the uh, picture is a bit more um, uh, fragmented, uh, it's not so obvious, uh, um, but I cannot see at the moment in Italy, you know, a real uptaking of these alternative uh, uh, ways of working that uh, we had experimented uh, during the, 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 the two and a half years of, uh, of pandemic. Um, I think this is a shame and I think this is, should really be pursued because uh, Reorganizing the way we work, uh, it is clearly not only a matter of, of personal well being. For many years, this was considered a women issue. Uh, you will all remember when we were saying, oh, especially for women, you have to have more flexibility uh, because it was considered that women were the social category, you know, who needed more um, conciliation of private time and private life with professional life. There was no general uptaking. Um, for many years, this was considered also a kind of a less important way of work uh, um, because the standard was to be in the office and have maybe, you know, the uh, long hours, uh, late night, uh, um, uh, important meetings with the, with the bosses, with the managers or where important people took decisions. Um, but clearly, as I said, this is not just a question of reconciliation of uh, private uh, and, uh, and work life, and for sure it's not just for women, and this we know very well, uh, but also can provide a collective answer, I mean, to some bigger challenges and very wide challenges of our times. Not only having a more sustainable welfare, which is clearly a, an important priority, but also showing um, inter intergenerational solidarity and therefore having, uh, you know, working all together in a different way, maybe a bit for longer, but less hours or in a different schemes, uh, so we, we can all have uh, a society which is more cohesive, has less social tensions and unrest, um, and also providing a very important response uh, to climate change uh, um, as we leave less carbon footprint, uh, as we enable uh, uh, you know, to diminish pollution, uh, and as we uh, compensate, uh, you know, for the many also uh, flights uh, or, or uh, uh, impacts that moving places has uh, on, uh, on the planet. New technologies, in my view, and I have been working for many years in this domain, so I've been 
focusing uh, most of my career on digital and, and innovation. Uh, new technologies can provide uh, tools uh, for doing things better for improving uh, uh, the way uh, we work and devising new models, not only in the way we have experiment, experimented until now, so real-time connection, being able to you know, connect uh, anytime, anywhere, um, and this should be a possibility for, for everyone, uh, but also in terms of better data ma management, time management, uh, um, trying to, um, conceiving workloads uh, in, in a more flexible uh, uh, and real-time way, uh, improving cooperative platforms and solutions, for instance, uh, making it more you know, human to, to, to interact uh, and making it more real than the way we are doing uh, right now in, uh, in, this, uh, in this debate. Um, and also, as you know, we have recently approved the European Parliament uh, uh, position uh, on uh, artificial intelligence, uh, I think there will be ways in which algorithms and the smart user and an uh, aware uh, user, a socially aware use of artificial intelligence uh, can open the way really to scenarios that we're not even able to predict uh, today, uh, right now. So the big question for me uh, in this panel is really, are we ready to explore these new opportunities? What can we do to have uh, more synergies uh, between the, academ the academia, the industry, the stakeholders, uh, um, uh, the, uh, the legislators and the politicians in order to conceive different models for the future and in order to think uh, uh, about a more sustainable uh, um, society? Uh, as a member of a socialist and democrats group, of course, uh, and I will uh, conclude on this note. Um, my answer is yes. Uh, we should be ready to explore these new opportunities. Uh, we should have more political will uh, to go forward, but with some caveats. The first one is, of course, that no one is left behind. Um, the second one would be that uh, new technologies and new tools uh, and new reforms of the way we work uh, are not discriminatory and can provide, I mean, more opportunities, not only for women, but in general for different, uh, um, uh, different uh, all uh, uh, components of society. And, um, and, but the algorithms uh, and the new artificial intelligence does not uh, discriminate against certain categories uh, uh, of people. Uh, and then that we set in place a proactive approach to skills gap. This, I think, is a very interesting uh, conversation that should be linked uh, to the whole idea of a reform of, uh, um, of, of the pensions uh, and uh, of the future of, uh, of the workplace. Uh, because we hear in many domains uh, that there is an important skill gap. For instance, I focus on cybersecurity and I hear that in Europe there are already 200,000 posts uh, or jobs which are not filled uh, in this domain because we don't have enough experts um, and we don't have enough, uh, um, uh, enough women. Uh, this morning I was chairing and hosting a, a big uh, uh, event on uh, maritime industry, a maritime exploration. And there again, you hear that there is a huge uh, skills gap to be filled uh, um, with all the new technological advancements and innovation in this field. But still, we don't do enough, uh, not only to uh, educate the, the, the young generations, uh, so to put them in a condition to enter the job market uh, early enough, uh, and uh, um, as Arnie as we said, you know, preparing themselves for the future, but we don't do enough uh, to reskill the you know, elderly or reskill the labor force uh, all along uh, uh, their life, uh, um, their careers and the, their work life. So um, this is the question I, um, I leave to the, to the panel, you know, are we ready to explore and what can we do in order to promote uh, uh, a better uh, matching of skills and a lifelong education that can bring us all to a better uh, scenario in the future.
Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Vitus Kovasi, for this really uh, very inspiring um, talk about uh, also the chances which we actually have currently and which we have to weigh. There are many ways to how we can also balance our gender differences uh, and make sure for much uh, intergenerational solidarity, take care for the environment by using tools which we have now and which have proved to be efficient, but where we have to work on the social and economic consequences still. Uh, so thanks a lot. I already see that there are two Q&As, uh, so please be encouraged to continue. Uh, uh, to write already now your questions and we will pick them up then after the last talk uh, and now it's my pleasure to introduce you uh, Professor Jutta Almendinger she's since 2007 uh, president of the VZB Berlin Social Science Center at the same time she's professor of educational sociology and labor market research at the Humboldt University here in Berlin uh, before that she was has worked uh, as director of the Institute for Employment Research. She was fellow at the Center for Advanced Study in Stanford and at Harvard Business School. She has had a professorship of sociology at the Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich. And she worked at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development in Berlin and at the Center for Survey Design and Methodology at Zuma, which is today GISIS in Mannheim. Her achievements were honored with numerous awards and I think it's not an exaggeration to say that the scope of her activities goes far beyond Berlin and also beyond topics of educational sociology and labor market research. She's also active in many advisory boards and in, in policy consultancy at the highest levels, including uh, the G7's Gender Equality Advisory Council. And I would say she's really one of the uh, leading uh, intele public intellectuals in Germany. So Jutta, it's a great pleasure to have you with us and the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh Thank you very, very much uh, for having me. Uh, I'm indeed just coming from the G7 uh, uh, in uh, Tokyo, uh, where we focused on some of those points which we are talking about right now. Uh, and uh, I came immediately, you know, linked to Beatrice because uh, the Italian government is increasingly concerned about uh, demographic change and the older society and, uh, of course, um, Japan as well. I will uh, start my uh, little remark with uh, four developments which I do not consider as being crisis. I mean, they are simply factual de developments. The first is uh, that we envision an increased life expectancy, in particular life expectancy in good health. Um, this life expectancy, however, is uh, greatly skewed uh, by social economic status. Uh, so we have to consider this. Second, uh, we have a considerable demographic change in some countries more than in others, uh, but uh, all we know is uh, that uh, this will be a trend which we are going to see in many, many other countries as well. Third, uh, we face great developments in technology in digitalization and digitalization and globalization, which means that there's a lot of pressure to change jobs over your lifetime. And far forth, uh, we uh, don't see any way back uh, considering uh, the enrollment of women in the labor force and uh, the wish to have an equal share in the labor force as well. We talked in particular with the Italian de uh, uh, delegation uh, yesterday about the declining birth rate uh, in Italy and uh, that women uh, say, well, it's not an end to work, end or, but it's an or to work or having uh, children. This is not the way we want to see it. And uh, I just have uh, first German data which tell us that we are going in this direction as well. Having said uh, this, um, I uh, would like to point out a couple of things. Uh, and the first is uh, that we have to overcome binary solutions. And uh, the one thing is uh, that we have to give up uh, fixed retirement ages. So we do not have a fixed entry in the labor market. And I never understood why we have a fixed exit of the labor market for just everyone. We all know that it's quite different uh, whether you are working as an academic and, uh, well, I have many directors, it's this wonderful uh, bits it be, and most of them really want to work much longer than uh, age 65, which is uh, mandatory if you want to put it like this, retirement age for professors in Berlin. I myself now even uh, received 
additional money because I'm older than 65 as some sort of credit uh, that uh, I do not draw on my pension money. This, of course, you know, increases uh, differences which we already see in terms of pension money. So um, we need to depart uh, from this binary solution. The other binary solution which we sort of uh, have, still have, is that we see in either being enrolled in the labor market or being in retirement uh, and uh, or being not in the labor market at different stages in our life. And this we have to overcome as well. So we have to find solutions where we work and draw retirement uh, pensions or where we work and care for ca uh, family without, you know, uh, reducing uh, the money and our income tremendously. Secondly, um, I would like to uh, point to at least uh, four different uh, topics where we need to increase the resilience uh, of people to use uh, Arsenal's works. First, um, I think it's uh, indeed extremely necessary to invest much more than we do right now in further training. And with further training, I don't refer to lifelong learning. I really refer to learning a second job, a second occupation, where in Germany, at least, we are not good in at all. Um, so uh, people are aware of this. I just saw a new survey where many people uh, complain uh, that they don't think that they can stay in the job until retirement, uh, but that they also don't have the option to take out two years uh, to go back to vocational training or to higher education to learn a quite different job. This we have to uh, do, and this also means that we have to, that we can increase the resilience of people and the willingness of people. Uh, the same applies for a basic uh, education for our young children. We have to teach them much more than math, which we also have in, in reading and things like this. We also have to teach them in health education, which seems to be a really a major topic in these days, even the increasing differences. And I already started saying this uh, in life expectancy and in particular in good and healthy life expectancy for uh, all people. And good training, we all know this, and a good head start for all also means uh, that you uh, think that you are up to and capable learning uh, different occupations or a second or a third occupation. Uh, the third uh, point um, is uh, referring uh, to um, the division of paid and unpaid work uh, between men and women. We know that in particular, the mental load of women is so much higher than the mental load of men. We also know that women, instead of uh, sort of getting some relaxation from uh, works and have to do a lot of more care work in terms of hours worked for their children and for, for, for their parents. And resilience for me also means to divide unpaid care work and other work uh, better between men and women. And my final point is uh, that uh, once we head towards a longer working life, we also uh, have to allow people to take some time out uh, for volunteer work, for family, for uh, the up and downs in a family life. Uh, uh, if you have children, you must uh, be able to work uh, shorter working times. So I'm not talking about a four days uh, Weak, but uh, I'm uh, really uh, defend uh, all who claim that there must be a, a short reduction uh, down to 35 hours a week calculated over the entire life course. And the entire life course may be much, much longer than our working life course uh, right now. My third and final point is uh, that. Uh, saying all that we really have to be aware that social inequality may possibly increase by doing everything I just said. And uh, so in implementing policies uh, for longer uh, work uh, and uh, probably uh, 
and most certainly for uh, getting training in a second and third uh, occupation, we need to have social inequality in mind because right now we see that further education is the advantage of a few, that we have a huge Matthew effect here as we have uh, in education, uh, depending on the family you are born in, as we have in uh, uh, a longer uh, workforce participation. Uh, so having said uh, this, I'm eager uh, to uh, learn what uh, others have to say. And thanks again for having the possibility to talk to you. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this really very inspiring uh, oversight on, on different aspects of, of how we can make our lives more flexible at the end of the day and get, a, get away from binary unfair solutions uh, uh, in dis discriminating age groups as well as uh, to, uh, leading to gender discrimination and even social inequality. So it's really a lot of, a lot of food for thought then for the, for the discussion later. Um, so uh, let me hand over now to Ulrich Becker. Um, Ulrich Becker is uh, since 2002 director of the Max Planck Institute for Social Law and Social Policy in Munich and one of the leading experts for, for international social law. His academic career led him from the Julius Maximilians University in Würzburg uh, to the, uh, the European University Institute in Florence, to the Universities of Regensburg and Greifswald, uh, Ludwig Maximilians University in Munich and the Harvard Law School. He's a member of the Academia Europea and Europe is always in his focus. For instance, his institute recently published pension maps, which visualize the institutional structure of older age security worldwide. So, Ulrich Becker, it's a pleasure to have you with us, and the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much for having me. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction. I'll be rather brief, I have to say, because um, I, I, I do not have so much to say on better quality of work as such. First of all, I ask myself, why do we put this in, in this context, better quality of work for, for longer work? I mean, better quality of work is something we should have in any case. So I think that's, that's uh, as a starting point, I would say it's not just in order to work longer, of course. But, and I can see that there is a relationship between you, you'll be able to work longer if you work better. Of course, we can see that. And I think we can also learn it from all the discussions on raising the pensionable age, for example. So why do we have these discussions so much in countries like Germany, but not so much in Denmark, for example, which are very neighboring countries? So is it just different cultures there, or is there also are there differences in, in the way uh, labor market actually works? So I, I think that would be an interesting question. I very much share the view of uh, Jutta Almendinger, I wouldn't say it's crises we're dealing with. It's uh, it's at least seen from social security. It's the factual conditions uh, in which social security have to work. We may, could put it this way, and uh, and uh, I also uh, would very much like uh, subscribe uh, the idea that it's not just about the pensionable age. Also seen from a social security perspective, there's much more to it and much more can be done. Uh, in particular, if we take serious these ideas of having more flexible work, of having uh, more time for family, of having more time for even vocational training. I don't know whether you have to make this distinction between lifelong learning and, and second education, but whatever, the, the, the better education and more time for, for, for this kind of, of, uh, of, of uh, life, I, this also can be done within social security systems because they should give incentives in order to also interrupt your working life and to, 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 to have these, these different phases, uh, education, work, and so on. So there's uh, a lot that can be done. And just one last point on social inequality. I also um, think that's a, a, exactly a very important point. And what we can see is we might step back a bit from this idea of sus sustainability of old age pension if we just understand by that, that the pensions have to be paid out of contributions and, and in a very sustainable way. 
it has to be more solidary in the organization. So that means also within old age pension security systems, you can have a certain uh, sort of redistribution between those who are better off and those who are not that uh, good off. And this is in, in particular in, important in, in the context of the pensionable age. So I'm coming back to the pensionable age again, because what we know is that those who are not that well educated and they do not learn that much will also life have a shorter life. So that means at the end, these will be the people who have to pay for that. And, and this again is a good argument in order to have a bit more redistribution in the system. I'm not so sure about uh, the pensionable age and whether you need some sort of, let's say, fixed uh, ideas, I would say, I, I, I agree, it has to be much more flexible. I, I mean, uh, uh, the social security systems are quite open for that. So you can work and, and get some pension. So you can mix it in a certain way. The only thing which is needed and will be needed, I think is a certain, let's say calculation basis in a certain way. So you should have some ideas on how you calculate the benefits. And this means also that you have some ideas on how many years you would have to pay and when you would have to go. But that's it uh, for, for the moment. I'm very much looking forward to, to the discussion and to learning a bit more in particular about the, 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 the better quality of work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ulrich Becker, for this uh, for this uh, inspiring uh, insights. Uh, so uh, I think there's also many points which we have to tackle la later in the discussion, which you brought up, uh, and also between the panelists. So uh, let me hand over directly then to uh, Massimiliano Mascherini. Um, he, uh, he is since 2019 head of the Social Policies Unit at Eurofound, where he worked since 2009 as a research manager um, with a focus on labor market issues, particularly of youth and women, but also on ad hoc research challenges, uh, such the, as during the, the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, he was scientific officer of the Joint Research Center of the European Commission after an academic career, uh, which led him to Florence, Sydney, Aalborg and Rome. Uh, uh, Massimiano, it's great to have you with us. The floor is yours. Thanks a lot and thanks for the invitation. And uh, I have to say that uh, the, previous, the previous speeches were quite inspirational. Actually. And I'd like to try to address a few points, actually, from... Uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, yes, our, our data from the European Working Condition Survey actually uh, shows that uh, the decision of remaining in the labor market uh, is a complex one. And uh, it, uh, uh, it is dependent by individual factors, as, for example, uh, education, but health and uh, the needs of care, actually, of uh, uh, grandchildren or, or as well as for uh, working conditions. Uh, and uh, uh, regarding the working conditions, what we see is that uh, after the age of the working conditions, of uh, workers change, and uh, uh, this means that uh, those who remain actually has different working conditions than those who basically uh, leave the labor market. And in particular, we saw that the critical risk decreased uh, after the age of 57, uh, as well as uh, working with uh, uh, high speed uh, and have a very tight deadlines, actually, uh, as well as uh, long hours that drop after after uh, the age of uh, 20 of uh, 55 and uh, flexibility, working time flexibility actually uh, increase. So uh, there is uh, there is uh, those who work before actually had much higher. Uh, working time flexibility than those that, on the other hand. So uh, these are uh, important characteristics, actually, because confirm the importance of, of a flexibility. Yeah. However, I would say that uh, regarding flexibility, uh, it is a work organization flexibility as well as the use of uh, uh, IT, ICT, hybrid form of work, and algorithms like, like mentioned earlier. In these, actually, we have, I think, to, uh, to understand that digitalization can provide useful tools to integrate everyone in the labor market or to help to integrate everyone in the labor market, but also 
can become a driver of future inequality, actually. First of all, uh, the use of, uh, of digitalization uh, and hybrid form of work for enhancing places only uh, apply to a, a, a limited amount of job. What we counted here at Eurofound, together with the Joint Research Center, is that uh, the upper bound estimate of a teleworkable job is a 38.5% over the total, actually. So 62% of the, of the jobs are not teleworkable, and these include cook, nurses, plumbers, drivers, and so on. Among those who are teleworkable, there are those who are teleworkable, uh, and this is 50% of the of the of the of the total number of jobs, and then the remaining 35, they have a lot of social interactions, so they can be teleworkable, but not at the same level. So we are in a way talking about uh, a, a limited amount of job, but they, where flexibility can be brought through uh, digitalization. And uh, of course, uh, this job actually uh, are jobs that are characterized by high income and uh, high educational level. Uh, so it's, uh, 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 the thing that uh, uh, we would need uh, to be careful is that telework uh, concern only a minority of individuals and uh, uh, could become also another form of privilege that could actually uh, provide a, a, an additional benefit that is granted to high, already higher payer uh, occupation. So it is important, uh, it is a, 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 a new form, it is an important tool to use, but uh, we also need to think about the remaining 62% that cannot be uh, in the population. And then uh, regarding algorithm, actually, uh, yes, artificial intelligence and digitalization, again, can be very useful actually for uh, uh, making us working better. Uh, the, the thing is that they can also unleash agglomeration forces that, that can further lead to economic and social disparities among citizens among territories. Among citizens for the mentioned uh, digital divide, that do not allow anyone to make use at the same level or in the same way to uh, digital uh, technologies and uh, uh, digital solutions. And in terms of territories, because you know that certain regions, prevalently rural or uh, slow in order to implement the digitalization. So uh, economic development actually uh, can be uh, more slow in these countries and so create the so-called divergence among regions. So it's important is to, to address. We can think about the different realities that we see now is like the Netherlands or the Baltic Republic, the Baltic Republic in comparison to the south of the south. Uh, so this, uh, this overall digitalization. The last point actually, and then I conclude is, uh, yes, we need to look at intergenerational difference uh, because uh, uh, the victim of the recessions and of the COVID-19 pandemic has, has, has been respectively young people and young women. So uh, it is important that uh, uh, we think to a lifelong cycle, as it was also hinted uh, earlier, in order to uh, uh, to build a working better uh, 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 age, but also to increase the market participation, especially of the young people. Uh, and to think about uh, their, their salary and wage as well. Uh, we did uh, a recent study at Eurofound where we computed the change in income over the past 10 years. And uh, uh, in many, in three European, in three class, three of, three of four, four group of uh, member states, actually, we saw that uh, the uh, income of older people grew much more uh, than people in the last 10 years. And in South Mediterranean countries, there is a huge divergence where older people are the only group where income was low. Uh, and in the, in the East, happened the opposite, that young people increase their income much more than older people. So it is important actually to also to address this in order to ensure social cohesion in Europe. Thanks a lot.
Yeah, thanks a lot, Massimiliano, for, for alerting us about all these kind of disparities, which we also have to face in the future uh, in that regard. And I think uh, if I look into the questions which come from the audience, um, people are, are also very much interested in, in, in aspects which all of you have raised. Um, so uh, let me perhaps uh, start with the latest point um, uh, from Krista Müller-Metzger. How do we manage to convince people that working longer combined with better work, more training and the opportunity to take new paths and work even in old age is a good one? No one, no party dares to make this statement because most people want to stop with work as early as possible. So this refers to all what many of you also touched that um, we have currently also a situation where in some countries we have uh, more than only protest against the, uh, the rise of retirement age, even appraisals. And uh, in other countries, it's for comparison, in comparison comparatively calm. And, and then the question is, what is the reasons for uh, what are the reasons for that is it because uh, they did a smarter policy it was a more flexible policy it was better uh, explained uh, why is that happening that we have also in europe uh, such a, a great diverse uh, disparity in terms of acceptance for the uh, retirement age uh, uh, raising the retirement age uh, what is your explanation for that that we see in france really harsh uh, reactions in other countries much less well, Becca, you, I think you also mentioned this point. Is it, is it better policies? Is it better legislation? Uh, what makes it so different? Um, I, I'm, I, I have to say I can't answer this question because I'm, I'm just raising it as well. So mm. uh, you can, of course, you can see also some political uh, differences, like in, like in France. That's also partly uh, due to the procedure they have chosen for 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 this reform. So one should not forget that. But at 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 the bottom of all this, so the question really also is to me: Why is it so much easier? Obviously, in Scandinavia, just take a positive example. To just take Scandinavia, where in Denmark, for example, they 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 discuss the pensionable age up to 2050, which is a bit strange in a certain way because you never know what will be what will happen uh, until then but but they 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 had this sort of discussion open discussion as far as i can see that uh, maybe but maybe really it's it's another way of of political uh, discussions and political solutions that could be the case and maybe it's not so much about the working conditions but i'm not sure i have to say mm -hmm. You just mentioned the case, uh, uh, I just come back to you also on that, I just mentioned the case of the Nordic countries where as far as I know, but I'm not an expert on that, um, uh, they also have much more opportunities to work longer in different schemes and uh, not to get reduction of your, your additional income uh, from the pension. So a bit more flexibility to earn more than your pension. And, and I think that is also something which makes it easier to accept that you might work simply under a different regime. Uh, Frau Almedig, she, she also, you also raised this this point that we should not have this clear distinction. Yeah. So one uh, thing you already uh, said, and this is more or less in line to uh, what Ulrich Becker was just saying, uh, but then uh, we see di uh, other differences. Uh, one is uh, that in other countries we change jobs or people change jobs much more often uh, than in Germany. Like uh, I'm uh, in the supervisory board of the Berlin city cleaning. And uh, they are supposed to do the sitting cleaning stuff, uh, garbage cans, emptying and things like this for their entire life. And of course they can't. So most people drop out uh, at the age of 56 or something like this. This is far away from 67. And we leave them with this very small uh, pension uh, behind rather than uh, enabling them uh, to take on different jobs and uh, the uh, city cleaning company. I mean, this is huge. We are talking about thousands of workers in many, many, many different occupations. So why not changing jobs? But this, of course, needs this enabling. This needs to have uh, you know, this continuous training or however you want. Uh, I'm just, well, continuous training for me is learning another software or whatever, but uh, I'm really talking about a change in the occupation so that you have then uh, after you did uh, this street work uh, a job uh, like in the administration or somewhere. And uh, if you compare the number of job changes in the US and also to Scandinavian countries, uh, we still have this vision that uh, one education, uh, one vocational training system in one shop uh, should hold for the entire life course. And this uh, is not the way to go. Uh, this can't be done. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, it's a very, very interesting statement. So we have also some reflections from the audience uh, um, on that. Uh, so um, uh, this flexibility. And probably, uh, uh, Andreas, please yeah. allow me to make an additional point because uh, what uh, has been asked uh, by uh, Christa Möller-Metzger is, uh, well, as I said before, in some occupations, you sort of don't get rid uh, of your workers. <laughs> you want to put it negatively. They really want many, many people uh, in, in, in academia or in jobs or architects or lawyers yeah, really want to work above the age of 68, uh, something like this. And uh, I can't uh, employ them longer than 68. Mm. So there is a clear cut. Then, of course, they can work, but not uh, in this uh, profession which they had or with this uh, employer which they had before. So it's not that people in general don't want to work. I mean, we know from many surveys that there are some sort of intrinsic motivation to work, but uh, they have to be enabled to do that. Yeah, there's uh, absolutely. There's also, also a question from the floor that um, uh, a person, a commentator, really liked the the focus on developing more flexible working opportunities to ensure better private work life balance, but also working longer. Um, and uh, ask, of course, uh, uh, one of the big issues for the older population is the digital divide. Uh, do you have any ideas for overcoming this particular barrier? So that uh, uh, it's not only to take new jobs, but also to, to come across that. So I remember very well, uh, the former president of the Akatech, uh, who was a manager of SAP once told me that um, he would not be able anymore to do the job which he did with 30 because everything has to completely changed. Uh, so he's now in management, but he could not easily adapt to that because this is completely different uh, environment and much more speedy. And, uh, and uh, so actually he has then to think about a completely different job, but now everything goes into to a, a digital uh, component. And the question is then uh, taken here by Elaine Dewhurst. How can we prepare people for that to make them more resilient for future job markets? Any any ideas on the, on the floor on that? Marci uh, Beatrice Kovasi? Yes, I just wanted to say a couple of things because I will have to leave you to another mm -hmm. e event uh, commitment right now. Uh, but I think indeed, I mean, it shows the conversation until now, it shows that there is a lot of uh, um, uh, you know, uh, ambiguity about the role that new technologies and innovation can have uh, on the future of work and the, and the uh, possible inequalities, uh, you know, effects. Uh, um, I think that that's basically is why, you know, um, it is important that we have the right policies in place because uh, technology, you know, is, uh, it can be used for many different things, you know, and according how you use it and uh, or how you promote certain R&D or certain apps or devices, then you can have, you know, good effects or bad effects. And this, uh, uh, we, are, we are quite clear about it. I, I think that, I mean, what uh, maybe we have to put in the picture as well is that we, we should not keep thinking about the jobs we know today in the sense that we should not just focus on, uh, you know, the, the upper part that was mentioned, I think, by, by Massimiliano Mascherini, you know, of telework, who can telework today at 38%. I think we should start thinking also how artificial intelligence and technology and innovation impacts on factory workers, impacts on the production lines. Um, we, we are in, in the middle, really in the midst of uh, a, a huge twin transition, green, and digital. Um, we are trying to devise here with a lot of difficulties, of course, uh, a strategy, a new industrial strategy with net zero to see how our whole system of production, our whole system, you know, of uh, uh, doing things, uh, I mean, and, and producing outcome in the European Union can be re rethought. So we should not put limits uh, to what can be uh, done also to put good use of technology making more traditional uh, works and non teleworkable works uh, uh, better, easier with uh, shorter turns, for instance, you know, and also to the question you put at the beginning um, about, you know, people don't want to uh, work longer. Yes, of course, if you tell people, well, you have to work, you know, the same way you do today, uh, three, five more years, uh, that's negative. But what if you say people, well, you will work two or three years more, but you will work less days a week, you know, promoting different patterns. You work four days a week uh, and you work for less hours, for instance, in order to make it better for everybody. So I think we should explore these new opportunities. And of course, then 
I will conclude on this note, you know, uh, for politicians with no retirement age, as long as uh, they are voted for, then, uh, you know, as the European Parliament, you can be, uh, there's no upper limit, uh, you can work as long uh, as, uh, uh, as you can. And thank you very much again. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us. And, and uh, 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 yeah, perhaps we have a few more minutes to go. And I would like to pick up one last question from the floor. Uh, many people in Europe still convinced that longer working life will reduce opportunities for young people. What can be said about this and the lump of labor fallacy? So that's more or less refers to the intergenerational solidarity issue, which was also raised in many of the contributions we heard today. Who, who would like to, to answer to that question? How can we ensure that also young people's chances to get better career positions are, are not hindered by, by old people uh, staying in their jobs. Uh, if, if I can say the, 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 the uh, evidence that shows basically that uh, uh, countries with a higher level of uh, labor market participation of older people are those with the higher level of labor market participation of young people. So it's like there is a structural access to labor markets. Uh, so I, I would not see these uh, as uh, as uh, as a possible uh, uh, as a possible problem. Actually, at least uh, in uh, in many uh, of of these occupations. Uh, so this actually, very shortly. Well, one thing that uh, actually, and then I will shut up forever, at least for these for these uh, for these events, uh, is. Uh, that, uh, uh, yes, we need to think also that uh, not all the older, older workers arrive, reach the, in, the, in the period of 55, 64, continues to work. There are people that is losing job, actually. And uh, the reintegration of those who are losing job at the age of 55 is essential. Because uh, uh, those who lose job at the age of 55 are those uh, that uh, are more at risk in the population to become long-term unemployment, unemployed, because it's very then difficult to re-enter in the labor market. So for them, we need to think uh, to a combined package of support, actually, that include advice, training, employment, uh, that will increase the likelihood of them to re-enter in the labor market. Because unfortunately, there is not only those that are at work, but also those who lose the job and would love to re-enter because they have to pay a mortgage because they have to finish uh, uh, and, and being uh, active for their life. Okay. So we also need to think to this segment that sometimes is forgotten. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't see any other comments from the panel. So uh, perhaps I, because we only have a few minutes, uh, we can perhaps go a little bit over the time because we started a bit later, but I would like to give Arnie the chance to wrap up a little bit on the contents and then take over again. Yeah, th thank you. Uh, thanks to all the participants, all the, also to Beatrice Kovassi who, who had to leave. Um, I think this is, is uh, a very uh, useful, very important uh, insights and input and reflections uh, that helps us tremendously uh, in this uh, in this project. Um, I think that the, 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 the issue that was mentioned that the jobs we see today, they are not Gonna, you know, the, the jobs in the future are not going to be the same as we see today, and that's important to, do, to keep in mind. It's also important when we think about the comment that was made about the uh, how young people perceive older people to crowd out the younger generation. But that's probably not going to be the case, given that the jobs are going to change so so fast. I thought the last comment by uh, Massimiliano was very uh, uh, interesting. Uh, and then I, I thought I, I wanted to end it. There was a, some talk about how the Scandinavian countries were able to do things a bit different. And, and here, I, I, since I'm Norwegian myself, uh, and, and I worked in Norway, but I, now I work in Italy. And I have to say that here in Italy, I really have no idea what I'm going to get as my pension. And it's very difficult to find out. I went to the, the site uh, of the Norwegian uh, institution and I just typed in my parameters and I it, it even asked me how many years would you like to work beyond uh, age 68 and then you just typed in there's different parameters and out it came uh, you know here's the the, the the pension that you're going to get 
if you now decide that you wanted to work uh, beyond the, or until 75. So that is just to say that in terms of technology, there is a there is a there is another aspect of it, and that is transparency and pre predictability. Uh, and I think uh, many people struggle to make these kind of choices now because they are very uncertain about what is actually going to happen to the future, given the choice they have to make, if they have the choice, uh, to, to retire either earlier or, or later. So, so all of these are very, uh, very important for insights, practical examples, that are just very important to feed back into the more academic, let's say, style of work that we are doing. And it's really, this event here has been a great example of how we bring uh, the, the two, two parts together. Uh, I would like to uh, end this again, uh, thanking uh, Population Europe, Andreas, uh, Kate and Peter for having organized this. And, and of course, a great thank you to the uh, participation uh, participants. Um, most, most appreciate it. Yeah, let me join you with that, uh, Annie, and also thank our speakers and panelists, uh, namely Beatrice Kovasi, Jutta Almendinger, Ulrich Becker, and Massimiliano Mascherini. And thanks, of course, also to you uh, that we made this possible to, to be together today. It was clear that we could not uh, come to answers for all these issues, but now I think we know where we have to think about uh, in the future agenda of social policies if we deal with these issues to make our uh, population more crisis resilient using new opportunities but also seeing the risk of inequalities so thanks a lot for all your input it was really very valuable and uh, highly appreciated and i would like to end up with a short announcement so uh, in the next berlin demography days it's a three days event from the 7th to the 9th of november 2023 will be on crisis resilience and we will do this event together with the futurist project and many other actors and uh, you accordingly then also invited to that event where we continue to discuss all these issues also in a global scale so thank you very much for attending and i wish you all a nice summer break i think we all deserve it and i hope it will be a wonderful summer also for you and thanks for joining us today and uh, see you again then at the next event bye-bye thank you